what is happening everybody welcome this is whistlekick martial arts radio episode 812 with my guest today shifu dimitri daniels some of you may know him as jade jackhammer i'm jeremy lesniak i don't have a fun nickname but i am here because i love traditional martial arts and we've done every episode of this show and we've founded this company because we love traditional martial arts and i say we because it's not just me anymore there are a whole bunch of us working on this stuff Eight people touch every single episode of Martial Arts Radio to share it and make it what it is today, the top rated martial arts podcast in the world. And we're very proud of that. And we will continue to work hard to make it even better. If you want to go to whistlekick.com, you can see all the things that we're doing, all the things that we're trying to make better constantly, because isn't that the martial arts way? And if you go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you're going to find everything related to this show not just this episode, but every show, every episode we've ever done, because we don't put anything behind a paywall. We don't take them down. We leave them out there for you indefinitely. If you want to go back and start at number one, uh, just give me a little bit of grace. I wasn't as good of an interviewer back then. You could do that. If you want to search for a topic, there's a search function. And we put transcripts up of all the episodes. So that way you have an easier time searching. Right? If you want to support us, Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can tell people about stuff. You can leave reviews. Really, word of mouth is is like the number one thing that I ask people for. But we've also got a family page, whistlekick.com slash family. What do we post there? We post on at least a weekly basis, some behind the scenes content. And we're giving you all the ways you can help us out because we're here to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. We want everybody in the world to train for at least six months because I think, and the rest of the team believes, that will make the world better. And let's make the world better together. I'd appreciate your help. Now, today's guest is one that I've known of for a few years, been following him on social media for a while, and he's quite the personality. But what we get here today is we get the man, the, the real man, the honest man. And I have to say, in speaking with Shifu Dimitri, I was, I was constantly blown away at how open he was willing to be. You know, there's there's a saying, warts and all, and I'm not saying that this, this man was sharing terrible things about himself, because he absolutely wasn't. But what he was sharing was the honest, open version of him. He didn't sugarcoat things. He talked about things that he'd done in his past that maybe he wouldn't do different, he would do differently now. And I loved getting to hear that. Martial arts makes us better versions of ourselves, doesn't it? And this episode is a great illustration of that. So here we are, my conversation with Shifu Dimitri, a.k.a. Jay Jackhammer. Hey, how's it going? Hey, not too bad. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's you... it's nice to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, same here. You were one of the first people I started following on TikTok. Whoa, really? Like a, like a year ago, yeah, yeah. A year ago, two years ago, whatever I got on TikTok, like you were, I mean, you were all over the place then. You were larger than life then, man. <laughs> Easy. Um, I, I can't believe that it kind of blew up the way it did, so. Yeah, well, you were you and you put you out there and people responded and that's cool. It, it was right? pretty, yeah, it was fun. Good. Yeah. Or is fun. I don't want to say it was like it's over. So, yeah. Right. Well, you got other stuff going on. We're going to talk about a lot of that. Excellent. All good. Yeah. Um, before we kind of dive in, you got anything from that you need from me? Anything you need to feel comfortable? Oh. Any questions you want to ask of me before we roll here? No, I'm, right. I'm really. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, then, you know what? Let's just keep what we got. We'll just we'll just start at zero with the audience. Get a bit of behind the scenes. They tend to like that. So awesome. I know some of the places we're going to go in our conversation today, uh, but there's probably far more that I don't know. Now, okay. we tend to start in a in a pretty fundamental way. Almost every episode, you can probably guess what that is because it's such an important thing. And and that is, how the heck did you get started as a martial artist? <laughs> how did i get started i have kind of a oh i don't know if you guys can hear that uh every first tuesday of the month there's like a tornado war <laughs> I'm in the, 
and that's it got me off guard it's um, fine we'll keep it excellent love it okay so i started trading when i was five years old um it was because my every male in my family i guess i was kind of lucky has done martial arts um my father had done tai chi my brothers and my cousins did uh karate actually mm -hmm. and uh, but i was kind of the lucky one that got a chance to uh train in chinese martial arts and so um my father had said that uh one of his work colleagues was like oh you know in china every male does uh kung fu and so um he was like oh i'm gonna put my kid in uh have him train with you you know it and so um, my original teacher was my father's colleague and he didn't, uh, he had like a family style that was kind of Shaolin-esque. I mean, if you want to say that, but, um, and then I trained with him. I trained with a couple of other uh, Chinese martial arts schools in my area. Mm -hmm. And then in the mid nineties, um, I got a chance to go to China and uh, start training. That's where my teacher uh, introduced me to uh, who my Shifu would be or his family because it mm -hmm. passed away. And then um, in about 98 is when I first went to the temple and I met my teacher, uh, Shri Chong. Okay. Yeah. So I'm doing a little bit of math here and, and you know, I, I never directly ask people their age. If you want to volunteer, that's fine. I'm 41 but, years old. Okay. All right. So, so you're starting in five, 41 uh that has you at like eight, 1986 you're started 86 that is wow that's pretty good Riff, yes well <laughs> I, I have i have two easy reference point i was born in 79 i started in 83 so i just have to do a little bit of math to get there but what i think's interesting is you know actually i recorded an episode earlier today where we talked about this it wasn't super common for kids that young to train or really kids at all and if they were training in the U.S., they were training karate or taekwondo. Yes, yes. So what was it? I mean, not not only is this unlikely that this is going to happen, which is awesome, but what was it about this guy that your father worked with? And he was like, oh, yeah, I'll teach a five-year-old. I think that it was just because, so like in China, kids do martial arts, they start off really early, right? And if it's like your family style um then as soon as your child can walk you really just start training and i think that because he didn't have kids and he's oh, like okay hey i mean he was talking about how i guess he i, I mean like i obviously don't know what the conversation was right. between my dad but um it was obviously something about how um it's something to make kids strong i mean i guess i was probably a little um i don't know i guess i was always kind of a like a not a bigger kid but like i wasn't really like soft and i was just kind of yeah energetic and i think that um he felt that it would be good like i okay. said my older brothers um they did karate my cousins had done karate um it originally started my father always said that he was a pacifist mm. but it started because we had gone to as kids there was this kids program in the area called matthew house and they introduced it was owned by a german lady and uh, named tamara youngman and she thought that it was great to put kids in martial arts and in music I actually used to be in a band when i was younger as well so what did you play i played the drums okay all right yeah. why why do you think your siblings ended up in karate and not you so because I was really young at the time and say like okay. my eldest brother, he would kind of play around teaching me stuff, but not really. And so this was separate from going with, so it, it was just kind of on a whim that they did okay. karate. And I mentioned my brother and my cousins because they went to this place, Matthew house. I was okay. young. And when I got older, I started going to the place, but it's because of them. I actually got a chance to go to China and, um, and then after that, my father had already had interactions with his, okay, his coworker. All right, that so. that makes sense. And again, a little bit more math. You were in China at like nine, ten years old. Yes, really. Wow. So so back then, it it's really crazy. So that's why people are like, "What? You started Shelly when you were five years old, and you went to the temple? No, no. <laughs> that's 
time, there is no way that would have happened. Right. Um, so I just, yeah. So I was older and I went with my father's friend. It, that's why. So it wasn't like um, my parents were like, you know what? We're going to send you to China. <laughs> yeah. And that's how. So I got to okay. close with his family. And yeah. Nice. All right. Mm -hmm. Um if we if we start plotting this out on like a timeline where where's the next hop where where do we begin so, uh, in 2008 i became a disciple of my shifu shida chung okay what does that mean so i kind of like it's like he accepted me into his family kind of so to so to speak um like where i take vows of like how I'm gonna live my life and like enter the family and things like that. Okay. How many how many disciples does he have? You know, I don't know. He has is quite this, a, a couple. It's quite a few. Yeah, he he has quite a few over over the years. I know that the the ones that predate me are actually. I don't know if you've had heard of uh, Gene Ching. He He's been on the show. On the straight. Yeah. Hey. Yes. Gene is my elder brother. Yeah. Gene's a great guy. <laughs> Love Gene crazy thing though i've spoken to him so many times we've never actually met no way oh that's <laughs> yeah. funny i love yeah. it yeah so i um my teacher kind of so i i speak chinese um mm -hmm. fluent and so my teacher kind of made me the person that was kind of in charge of like helping the non-chinese students like in the west to uh kind of help with the teachings that he gives mm. us so that's kind of even how like the TikTok thing and all of that happened. Yeah. Okay. So what happened between if I, again, if I'm doing math right, you visit the temple for the first time when you're about 18. Dude, I was then, actually, yeah, 17. 17. Okay. And then 10 years later, you become a disciple. Obviously, there's Oh, I was going every year. I was going every year. Okay, but you you said in 2008 I became his disciple. Right. I, I was so, trying to give you, let you know in between what was happening, yeah. like going for the summers. Great. It it sounds like that just the way you're describing uh, becoming a disciple that this is not a decision to be taken lightly. Yes. That it's probably a bond that you don't sever easily, if at all. Yes. Um. And. So if that is the case, then it, it suggests to me that in the years prior, there were things going on that were really significant for you where you were not only willing, but excited to make that commitment. So talk about that that 10 year span from so, first time at the temple to going all in. You know, so it's actually kind of funny that you say that because literally I would go there and train every year for the summers, come back go back and forth between the states. I was also training at martial arts schools in the states as well, just mm -hmm. only there for two, three months for the summer. That's not really long at all to actually train. Um, so, but I would go back and forth and train. And it's weird, in 2008, um, I, like he already, he always expected me at a certain time. I always left like June 2nd and arrived there. And um, so uh, one year, uh, I get flown into um, Zhengzhou, which is like the capital of Henan province. Mm -hmm. So from there to the temple is about maybe, back then it was like a three hour bus ride. Um, and so one of the students, uh, one of our elder brothers and one of the just foreign students that had gone to the school, because at this time my shifu was out of the temple. Mm -hmm. And um, he's like, oh, hey, uh, he was a French student. He's like, oh, you're Shifu's disciple from the States, from Chicago. And I was like, what? I am? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, so the thing is, is because, so so in Chinese to say disciple is tu di, um, and then to say student is xue sheng. So if someone's speaking to you, usually, they would say uh, a student and not 2D. And so I was like, um, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> okay, um, that's cool. I, I guess, yeah, I am. And they took me. You, you, didn't, you didn't quite understand at the time what that meant? Or... No, I understood what it meant, but I was like, 
sense. When, why didn't I get the memo? Uh, oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> I was I like, get it now. this disciple? Everybody knew about this but me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I arrived, and then that year, um, we were sitting. Uh, he was giving me a ride. I was getting ready to actually leave. Mm. And um, he was taking me to the airport, and he was like, oh, I think that it's um, uh, it's a good time for us to further our relationship. And and so I was like, oh, further our relationship. And then sounds, it was kind of, sounds romantic. <laughs> that's that I was seeing it was like, oh, okay, cool. I mean, like I, I <laughs> understood what he was talking about. Yeah. It wasn't like he we were at a candlelight dinner. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, nothing crazy like that. And so, um, yeah, and that's kind of like how it started. I mean, it was a really, it was a personal thing. And uh, so I was. I understand, you know, roughly what the act of becoming the disciple might be, but what about what was different before and after? So, you know, I think that it was, for me, it seemed like it was like, it's a, um, I don't know, kind of like your father takes care of his child. But I think before it didn't seem, so um, I guess we have to go back to the idea of the way things are done in Shaolin. Okay. So in Shaolin and, and in China, generally for Chinese martial artists, they're actually like real teachers, is that, I don't know if you've, so you've seen the movies where someone will want to go to the temple and they're like, oh, admit me into the temple. I mm. want to train people and all of this. Right. And then the temple just closes their doors and they sit outside like right. yield. They, they test rock. them. You're, you're yeah. not ready. We, we're going to test you and not tell you how long you have to do it. We just decide one day that you've suffered enough and you're working. Yeah. Yes. A big thing that's really descriptive is kind of like they'll be kneeling, but they'll be on some rock, mm. kneeling on a rock. So usually the movies they portray them like they've been there for a long time, rain, snow, and, and like their knees are bleeding because they were on a rock. And I believe like that's just the metaphor for the idea of one of the first questions that they ask you is, Ninam Kuma, can you endure hardship? Mm -hmm. And so that's, and so it wasn't just so much that you're kneeling, but like on a rock, so you're extremely uh, uncomfortable and you're still able to do it until someone opens the gate. Now, obviously I didn't have to do that, uh, but I think the way that teaching is, is that it takes time for a teacher to decide if some if someone's really the per type of person that not only just to represent them but someone to teach them uh kind of like the real ways of the the martial culture sure and so that's why i think that was a little bit different um i did notice it's kind of funny a story i always end up telling people is how about i started doing drunken fist mm. is that he uh, every year I would go back to China and he would see me. And this was after, um, this was right, uh, probably a couple of times before I became the disciple, but he'd be like, what's happened to you? You've gotten fat, go run. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> if, if you're listening and you're not watching, I was just taking a sip of coffee and just totally <laughs> almost dropped a spit take. Uh, please continue. <laughs> yes. And I was like, well, wow, um, okay how long do I have to go run? And he's like, go run. And so I would just go run. And um, I would also like to add that I was actually in really good shape, but in China, they perceive uh, I was a weightlifter. Uh, I played football in high school. And so I was always into weightlifting. And so I was stockier, muscular, but in China, they would call it like fat meat, <laughs> whether it's cellulose, or if it's meat, muscle, right? They be fat, and so he would tell me to go run. I go run. Ever so often, I would run past the school, make sure he sees me, that he doesn't forget about me. <laughs> and um, and this would happen all the time. I'd be like, "Let me talk about and that would be the first thing he say to me before he said hello. Is what's happening? You? You've gotten fat. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, one year, this was probably in maybe two thousand. I think this was 2009 and so i'm about to leave and he gives he hands me this dvd this like little 
Oh, actually, it was a VCD. That was those were kind of big in China. Yep. Um, and so it was him doing kind of like the Shaolin basics, and and he's like, yeah. So I want you to take this. I had made this for a school. They gave me a whole bunch of them. So I think you can use these and you can practice. And I'm like thinking to myself, man, he really thinks I don't train when I'm in. When, like I trained literally for like six to eight hours a day when I was in the States as well. Um, that's kind of the luxury of being a kid that you have all this time to train. And, but like, um, okay, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll practice it and make sure that I have everything down. And so I take it back to the States. I had already known the basics, but okay, whatever. And on the video going past it, there was a performance of him doing Drunken Fist. Oh. And I was like- and, and you hadn't seen him do that before? I hadn't seen him do it before. No, no, no. And so I was like, whoa. Now, was he doing it because he wanted me to really learn Drunken Fist and not, uh, not just the basics? Like, is, is that what it was? Was this like some secret thing? Later on, I was just realized that that's just the way that they had, he didn't make the DVD. Mm. So it just happened to be on there. And so I, I learned it. I went, I made sure that I went back and showed him that I learned everything. And he was really happy. And after that, he stopped telling me that uh, I got fat. He started grieving. Yeah. <laughs> I, awesome. And then I injured myself and then get fat, got fat. So, hey, yeah, it happens. <laughs> okay. I, I want to go back. You, you've used a word a couple times that I think bears some exploration, and that, that word is real. You know, it's no secret that there are plenty of people who uh, present martial arts in different ways. And I think for a lot of Chinese martial arts practitioners, especially in the in Kung Fu uh lineages that the temple the shaolin temple and going to china really represent something we've had a lot of people on the show who have had powerful experiences or furthered their training by traveling to china i'm guessing in using that word real as you've talked about a couple aspects there that you you have some opinions on the um, subject and i wonder if you might share if I would Okay, so basically what I mean real, um, probably not like what a lot of people would think, like, oh, well, just because this person trained in, in China or whatever, he did, oh, he's a real martial arts instructor. No, when I say real, I'm talking about the, the, the martial arts instructor that really takes on the, the father role. Mm -hmm. um, the word shifu, there's two words, two descriptions of the word shifu in, in Chinese. One is what you would naturally call any uh, martial artist or even someone who's like achieved something, whether they have they've gained skill, because we know Kung Fu or Kung Fu doesn't have anything to do with martial arts. Right. Uh, so, but anyone like you would say Shifu, like if I get in a taxi um, and I'm like, hey, Shifu, what's on to Nabia? Um, then you mm. say, it's just kind of like saying Mr. Okay. Um, it's, it's a term. Like, it's a term of respect. Yes, it's a term of term of respect. And then there's shi as in the coming from the word lao shi, which means teacher, and then fu from fu qin, which means father. So this is only what a disciple would call his teacher that he's become. Yeah, that he became a disciple. We would call him shi fu, and a lot of people don't really get that. And so it's important that that we talk about that idea. Is like your father. Um, if it, there are a lot of teachers that, oh, I want to do, do martial arts. I want to teach martial arts. So I'm going to open up a school. And they're mostly like coaches. They like people to call them Shifu or Sensei or Sabo Mim and all of these grand um, like titles. But they don't really teach the students as if they are their fathers. They are teaching more like it's just it's a business and like you pay me i teach you and you call me master so i treat you kind of like a slave you do what i tell mm -hmm. you to do. that's the way it is so that's what i mean when i say um like a real teacher someone that's mm -hmm. really going to uh, like believe in teaching the student as if they're a child because we are help raising them in their martial uh, their martial road so what, I, what I'm guessing, if I can 
try to say it in a different way. A lot of martial arts instructors, their role begins and at the beginning of class and ends at the end of the class. And what you're yes. talking about is 24 seven. Yes. yes. You are yes, yes. raising a martial artist. You're not simply teaching a student. And, and, and I've known martial arts instructors who are like that. You, you've probably seen there's a almost a cliche at this point meme that goes around and it's a um, probably put into other industries too, but there's a, a taller person and, and a smaller person and they're both made of puzzle pieces. And, you know, the, the metaphor is that the, the instructor is giving part of themselves, <laughs> right? And then, you know, you can carry it out and the person has very little of themselves left. And, you know, that's a whole other conversation, but I think the metaphor kind of fits here in that I believe as well as it sounds like you do that a good martial arts instructor it's not a few hours a week it's hey you know if you get an email or a text or a call you know these people are putting so much faith and trust and in you so much stock in what you have to offer i've heard from plenty of we've had plenty of folks on the show talked about how a student came to them, especially if they were a younger instructor, asking for, you know, like marriage advice. It's like, yes. I'm 20 and I'm not married. You know, like, <clears throat> you know, we just, we tend to, in a healthy teacher-student relationship, look at our teachers as uh, probably bigger than they are. Yes, I, I was, I would always say, and it's really kind of crazy, but I know that I had had, I was, relationships while I was in China and maybe things didn't go so well because I mean it's kind of hard to keep a relationship if you you're in one country and then you change to another country and right, and that, it's right? the ultimate long distance yeah <laughs> and so I would call my sheriff sometimes and talk to him about things and but he would always tell me ah wait yeah and so he'd always say my, my Chinese name is wait yeah um, and so he would tell me, oh, you know, that's just destiny. Keep training in Kung Fu. <laughs> 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 and so I would always think to myself, like, what? Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Now that I'm older, I guess I kind of get what um, he was talking about. Mm -hmm. I won't explain my idea on what he's talking about. I'll leave that for the viewers to kind of see if they can have that epiphany. Sure. But uh, yeah, but yeah, he, he was like my father. I think a lot of in, in that when you say instructors, you know, I think even uh, though say martial arts instructor, it's kind of not really a good term. I would say martial arts coaches. Because mm -hmm. you know, coaches, they don't, they just kind of like push you, they drive you, but they don't really do the, like, if your technique isn't correct, they don't really do a whole bunch of like correcting and things like that. I mean, think about how many uh, high school athletes or younger that have trained, but then we don't really know how to train. I remember mm -hmm. being in football, we had to do two a days where we did practice before class and then practice after school. And we'd also have to go to the gym. And so they didn't really teach us how to work out. I mean, what did every high school kid do? Guys always did bench press. <laughs> that was probably about it. Yeah, yep, that's it. You might do squats. Maybe uh, some yeah. bicep curls. Yes, yes, yes. And no one really, yeah, no one really taught you. And I think it's kind of like that's the coach. Like it's their job to just tell you to go and do something and they don't elaborate so much. But when you say instructor, I mean, what is the word? instructor mean like to to teach um, and so if i'm going to be a martial arts instructor martial being war or warlike and then art is just kind of like this the description of kind of like the the way it's done the way the martial or warlike skill is is taught right and so i think if you want to instruct you'd have to think of in martial arts not only do you teach someone movements but you teach them the reason why the movements are like this. Mm -hmm. And then you teach them how to use the movements. And then you teach them to forget about how you told them the movements are supposed to, so that it becomes part of you. And uh, so I think that if you're a martial arts instructor, you kind of need to do all of that. You can't just say, 
practice this Taolu or Pumse reform kata, yeah, which a lot of martial artists do that when they're teaching. I'm gonna take a hard left. Why don't you live in China? Why don't I live in China? Yeah. I actually moved back. Um, okay. In, yeah. So in twenty, uh, in twenty twelve, instead of living, because I started to do six months in America, six months in yeah. China. Um, I was traveling a lot. I was doing seminars at different schools around the, like just in the U.S. And I had actually done some movie choreography and things like that. So, but I ended up getting really, really busy. And around 2012, 2013, I, I kind of got burned out and I did, mm. I was living six months in America, six months in China. And one of my martial arts brothers, we actually opened our school together. Okay. Um, he had, a few years before had just left America and moved there. Mm. And he was always trying to tell me that I should do it because I was spending lots of money trying to live between both places. And then I decided to move there. Well, in 2016, in 2016, um, my girlfriend uh, got pregnant. So then I had to come back to the States. Mm. Though I was kind of like, I had a really long visa to live in China. Um, I, you can't really, even when you're married, uh, because we did get married right before we left, but mm -hmm. you can't get a green card. So even though you may be married and you can live in China for 10 years and then only have to leave like every six months, um, you're not allowed to work. You still need to oh, okay. Unlike in the States, if you come to America and then you get a green card, you're automatically able to work. You don't have to do anything separate. Okay. And, and let me tell you the reason I asked about why you didn't live in China <clears throat> is because you're, you're, you're talking about these two parts of your life but you don't really say a lot about your american life right you were talking about your your chinese life and i, and I fully understand yeah you know this, this sounds like where your heart was and probably still is but it wasn't until i asked you this question that you were oh well you know i had a school and teaching some seminars and everything and, and i i find it interesting as an interviewer that the stuff unsaid is often even more interesting for me than what is said. So you come back here in 2016, and then what? I go back to teaching. Um, so while I was in China, I would have, I actually opened up a boarding school um, okay. when I would teach foreigners and Chinese. Uh, so the Chinese students, they would learn English, and then they would mm -hmm. learn Shaolin, and then the uh, foreign students would learn Chinese and learn Shaolin. Um, so in the States, I mean, I think that in the States, I led kind of a pretty regular life. Um, aside from, I had done Taekwondo. Um, I was going to, uh, because my teacher didn't allow us to do competitions. When I was younger, I always felt like people were like, oh, wow, you're so good. You're so good. And I'm like, really? Like, how do you know that I'm good just because I do a form? Like I jump up and I, I move. <laughs> that doesn't mean I knew how to fight. So I wanted to, like, after a while, I never wanted to have a big head. So I'm like, well, that doesn't really mean anything. I mean, like I would get in maybe street fights with people, but when you're young, it, it I mean, yeah. So if you've trained and the person obviously hasn't trained, there is no competition. Mm. Uh, and so... I wanted to enter competitions. Well, my teacher didn't uh, allow that, being Buddhist mm. and like Shaolin's not for going and competing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, um, I was at my godparents, uh, they owned a gym and there was a Taekwondo instructor there. So they were like, hey, well, um, since you're not going to the Chinese martial arts school anymore that I had actually met them in, in uh, why don't you come in? Uh, you want to keep training? Why don't you come to this Taekwondo school that's in our gym and um, he can help you to get in tournaments? And so I kind of, it's a little bit underhanded. Hey, I was young. Um, and so I started doing Taekwondo um, because then if my teacher ever found out I was doing tournaments, oh, well, I was training at this Taekwondo school and they required it. 
So it's yeah, and so I uh, yeah, just to give myself a chance. You found a loophole. Yes. I don't, hey. I don't think I don't think you're the only one that would have done that. Yes, yes. I hope I'm not. Yeah, but um, I started doing taekwondo, and the school, uh, the instructor was like, "Oh, you know, you're pretty good," and uh, he gave me what's called a belt adjustment test. And I'm like, "What? What's a belt adjustment test?" And he's like, "Well, because you've already trained since you were five years old." You're obviously not a white belt, so I'm not gonna make you wear a white belt in class. And I was like, "But why? I've never done taekwondo before. Mm-hmm. Like, what is? Yeah." And he was like, "So what do you want me to do?" He's like, "Yeah, but you still don't martial arts. So why don't you show me your highest level form, and I can give you a, a ranking off that?" And I was like, "Well, okay, but um, we don't really have so Shaolin because it's not like it doesn't have a belt system." You just kind of train right so there isn't a really a level there's not like a higher level form or a lower level form you learn the basics and then you learn different fighting strategies which that's what the, the forms are and so at the time i was really big into doing tiger uh, for, for performance so i just performed a tiger form for him and he was like well that's really good well i can't make you a black belt because you don't know the style at all so I'll make you at his school like red belt was before black and so he made me a red belt and I started just uh, and then he was like slowly as you're training I'll teach you all the forms as well and after like a couple months of that he just started having me teach instead of actually teaching me taekwondo and I was like um okay but and were you teaching time. taekwondo or kung fu i was teaching taekwondo at his school so i was still okay. going yeah this was during in the states and so china for the summers and then being uh at this taekwondo school uh where the teacher he was like i was like but i don't know taekwondo <laughs> he was like you have really good kicks so you can just focus on teaching the kicks you know what good stances look like like their knee has to be over their ankle and things like that and so yeah, you know what a good stance is, so you can do it. I mean, obviously, I'm going to be there too. I'm like, okay. So I ended up learning the forms through correcting the students' stances. And uh, one day, he was like, hey, so I think you should test for black belt. Hmm. I'm like, test for black belt? I still don't know Taekwondo. (laughs) And he's like, well, I think because, I mean, there had been some problems with because he started having me i was about 17 at the time so he started having me teach the uh his adults and some of them were higher ranked than i was and Mm -hmm. they didn't like that and so there was one in particular that didn't really like it so much and i was like well how about this if you can beat me then you can teach i won't teach and so i I beat him up and (laughs) I mean, like he was, I was 17 and he was like approaching 40. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter how long you've been training. Um, the whole old Kung Fu master, the, um, the likelihood of you beating someone that's has some skill that's like going into their prime and you are someone who's already probably well out of your prime and your prime, even when you were in your prime, you weren't as good as... Mm but you started later in life yeah that, that's not really realistic that the right. older person is going to win and so um did that I mean, have the effect that you wanted it to yeah actually okay it did. um the, <laughs> the teacher got angry and it's not like i beat him up like broke him up or anything like that it's just i i showed him that he could learn from me and so that the teacher um was like, because of these problems though, he's like, yeah, unless you want to do that all the time, you should get a black black belt. I'm like, but it doesn't really mean anything to me. And so, but he's like, it'll make people feel more comfortable about learning from you. And so I was like, well, I guess, okay. So I literally, he gave me this like folder that had all of the Taekwondo forms from white belt to like eighth degree black belt. And I learned them all in like a month, two months. Mm, wow. I'm not going to say it's a base style, but because it's really linear and boxy, kind of like their form. Mm-hmm. So 
they are really easy to to learn. And then I took the test in front of the grandmaster and got my black belt. Nice. So okay. that was I ran I started to run his school for let's see. I did take one do attack with me for nine years. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I ended up changing the school from a Taekwondo school to a Chinese martial arts school because that's where my height, my heart right. was anyway. Did your Shifu in China find out, ever find out that you were doing Taekwondo? Um, so he never really like he never really asked me about things like that. He did find okay. out that I was in tournaments and he so what, did he did he care? What, did he care? Did um, he, he wasn't happy. He okay. was like, um, I, so I, I think for me, and it's really something that I've always struggled with, and most people do, is ego. Mm. I've never really wanted to have an ego. But when you get used to people constantly being like, oh, you're good, you're good, you might start to believe that. And so I started all these years, I had no problems, but then I started to, re- and it wasn't my ego about thinking that I'm great, but it was the fact that, I mean, as a traditional martial artist, people were constantly being like, oh, that stuff doesn't work. And oh, all of this. And so I was actually in China at the time and was talking to a friend that was at a club. Mm-hmm. And I was standing outside, it was a KTV club, a karaoke club. And I'm talking to my friend who's a girl, these two security guys, they were probably like 18, 19. And at this time I was 20, Four, 25 something like that and they come over and they start talking to me and talking to my friend first and saying hey you speak this foreigner's language now foreigner isn't an insult it's just the way the language is like they will call someone who's outside of the country a foreigner not okay. not being rude or anything like that it's just the way that they speak and so um she's like no um he speaks chinese and so they start talking to me and they're like, oh, you, what do you do here? I'm like, oh, I'm doing, a, I'm training in Shaolin Kung Fu. My teacher's school was right down the way. And so, <laughs> excuse me, they start telling me, oh, okay, so you're good at Kung Fu. Uh, you want to teach me? And I'm like, uh, you can't afford me. And they're like, oh, no, you can. So I'm like, if you want to train, why don't you go to my teacher's school? I'm not going to teach you. And I wasn't getting what he was talking about. And so my friend's like, mm. no, idiot, he wants to fight you. And I'm like, he wants to fight me? Like, look at his skinny little arms and legs against me. Like, there's no way you're gonna, like, he, and then he's like, well, the two of us can fight you. And I'm like, you can have five of you. The outcome's still gonna be the same. And uh, I was like, really? I'm like, yeah. So I was like, let's go then. I'm like, well, let's go. So we kind of, um, my friend kind of backed up and only one guy came in. I'm like, are you like, okay. And so we fought and he he runs in. Like the first thing he does is he runs it and throws like a, a roundhouse kick to my leg. And I kind of lifted my leg up to block and was just like, and he, he kind of like, it, it was so funny because he like rubs his shin like in a, like a Jackie Chan movie. <laughs> And so, and um, we're going around and then we go, um, I'm throwing kicks and punches at him. He's throwing kicks and punches at me. And then I like back kick him in the face and he goes back into the street and we start fighting and people are like starting to crowd. Mm-hmm. And Ben goes and tells us to stop. And and, I, and he was like, man, you're really good. I'm like, you know, you're pretty good too. And, um, and he's like, well, I train at Tago. And so Tago is like, um, in the village, Dongfeng, which is like the Shaolin village, it's like the largest martial arts school. Like, mm. they literally have like 70,000 students or something like that. Wow. And, and he was on their Sanda team or Sancho Sanda, like kickboxing, Chinese okay. kickboxing. And I'm like, oh my God, you, you are? Like, so you've actually trained? And he's like, yeah, how long have you trained? Um, And I was like, well, I've trained since I was five. I've been training for like, he's like, oh my God, that's longer than I've been alive. And I'm like, yeah, like, I'm so sorry that like, I was so rude and making fun of you saying that, but I thought you were just um, picking on me because you thought that I was Mm -hmm. so in the village, it's become kind of like a tourist 
place. So a lot of people, a lot of foreigners come, and not, and even Chinese, they come from all over to see the Shaolin Temple. Um, they'll do like little day seminars or stay for a couple weeks to get the experience of Shaolin and then leave. And so for the people that grew up there, that's kind of like they feel that it's like they're making a mockery of it. Mm. And so he um, he thought that I was one of those people and then he didn't. When he realized that I wasn't, we kind of became friends and then I realized that I shouldn't have done that. But um, I was bragging to my Kung Fu brothers about it because I was like, yeah, dudes, it was so cool. I kicked this dude's butt in the street. People were all like yelling, like go. And my teacher overheard it. Mm. And I got in trouble. And that's how he found out that I was uh, doing tournaments as well and stuff. So because I had to kind of come clean. Yeah. And, uh, and then he made me promise not to take challenges and stuff anymore. So do, yeah. do you, would you handle that situation the same way now? I mean, almost <clears throat> 20 years later, I get the <clears throat> sense, you know, just in, in the way you talked about it, the words you used, you know, exciting at the time, but uh, it sounds like, I guess we'll say you you you've changed your own mind as you've aged about something like that. Yes, that is true. I completely would have. Now I don't really care. Um, I when I first started doing TikTok and I was like I would run like Facebook and things for promotion of the school, but and I like I said I grew up with people always being like, "Oh, you're so great! Wow, you're doing so good." Like, even at that time, I'd had people that asked for my autograph, mm. which was, like, crazy. I'm, like, on cloud nine, right? And and then I get on TikTok, and it's the first time I found out what, like, a troll was. Mm. And so people started, I'd post some stuff, and people would be like, oh, that wouldn't work in a real fight. You suck. And I'm, and I'm like, what? Like, me? No one's ever said anything like that to me. And that's so stupid. And I'm like, well, well, you suck. <laughs> like, <laughs> you want to you wanna find out if it works or not? And um, and so I had a couple of people challenge me. And so me being someone that even my school in America, we won't really talk about it, but it was open for challenges. Sure. So uh, especially living in Chicago, um, if you get to say you can do something, you'd better be able to do it, right? And so <clears throat> I'm like, okay, the guy started, I was like, well, follow me so that we can contact each other. And I followed him, they followed me, you follow me. And then I message him and he's like, well, how do you want to do this? And I'm like, what do you mean? How do you want to do this? He's like, you're going to come out to me and I'm going to come out to you. Like, I'm in Florida. And I'm like, okay, you, you challenged me. So that means that you would come to me. Like, what are you talking right. about? And then he's like, oh, well, oh, well. Plane tickets. Yeah, I'll have to, well, we'll have to wait until, because we're in the pandemic, we'll have to wait until like the government gives like the stimulus and then I'll come. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Just, just let me know when. Just let me know when. He's like, let's do it in like three months or so. I'm like, go. Oh. Okay, cool, whatever. I mean, do it tomorrow. But if you want to wait to get money, okay, that's cool. And then he starts messaging me and he's like, oh, you know, you're a pretty big guy. And I'm like, uh, okay. Like, would you say that you've won most of your fights just because of your size? I'm like, no, I've won most of my fights because of my skill. But that's irrelevant. And he's like, oh, well, I've done this before with people, kind of talked to them, went out and then sparred them. I'm like, wait. What, what do you mean spar you, you challenged me that means that if you can't beat me it's gonna be a really rough ride home like and he's like oh well i was just talking about sparring and i'm like see like i, I think that before you say something to someone you kind of need to really know who they are mm -hmm. and not look at some 15 second video and try to make a judgment and try to sound cool so it, uh, needless to say he never showed up and, and he unfollowed me uh, I had someone else do it from California and I really thought that they were going to come like this guy said I mean from his TikTok profile he was like an ex-military dude he was like really skinny I don't know what the deal is with like small people wanting to fight big people but hey whatever well clearly he didn't want to fight you yes he didn't um and 
I was actually talking to my godfather, this is what kind of helped me, is that he, I was like, man, another guy challenged me. And so he's like, you're going to do it? I'm like, yeah, but he's actually said he's going to come here. He said the whole stimulus thing too, but he's actually going to come. And he wants to prove to me that my style is BS. And he was like, so are you going to kill him? And I'm like, am I going to kill him? And I'm like, he said he wants to challenge me. And he's like, so think about it. Someone is going to travel halfway across the United States to fight you that doesn't know you over 15 second videos. Do you honestly think that this person is going to come to uh, lose? Or what if you, you beat him, then what's going to happen? Like, do you know that he's not going to bring other people? Do you know that he's not going to try to shoot you or anything like that? And I'm like, um, well, I don't. But I mean, I guess I'm not opposed to killing him, but I would rather not. And he's like, so why are you going to accept the challenge? Hmm. Like, because he said he was going to. And I guess we'll figure out what happens. And so um, this guy never showed up, uh, obviously. Shocker. Yeah, in shocker, yeah, because that's what people do. Yeah, on the but when, when people challenge, they're never nearby. There's always a logistical reason that they can't get there. Yes. And they always want to have that conversation of why they can't go, you know, put action behind words privately, right? It's It's never like, you know, I'm I'm withdrawing my challenge because I can't afford the flight. It's always like, hey man, I I you know I would come kick your butt, but you know I don't have money for the plane ticket. <laughs> like it's all. I wasn't used to that, so I'm used to people always. Say, so I'm like, okay, but then after his talk with him, and I was like, man, I mean, I guess he does have a point, but and and I just thought about Buddhism and thinking about the idea that I mean, it's no one can make me angry or like it's all my choice how i choose why did i really care that they were talking smack about me mm. it's just because i had let my own ego get to me it was something that i wasn't used to and so i can only choose how i react to something so i've realized that that yeah that's ridiculous and just because someone something my teacher told me is like just because someone said that you're not good does that mean that you're not good? Like, what? why are you letting, um, and this is what he said to me about accepting the challenges or fighting in competitions. Like, what are you trying to prove? Like, are you doing martial arts for yourself? Or are you doing martial arts so that people can think that you're great? Right. There's and always so, going to be somebody that won't think you're great. Yes, yes. No matter how good you are. There, there's somebody out there who thinks you know, <laughs> Chuck Norris is a joke. <laughs> yeah right probably the martial artist that has the most acclaim yes people are they're always there's people there's, that... there's still somebody out there ah chuck norris sucks right like yes you can't, you can't make everybody happy that's true so yeah i i kind of changed my idea on how i should live my life because no matter what eventually sooner or later i am gonna lose but does that mean that i suck no it means that it happens i mean you have good days, you have bad days. You, yeah, people get older. Yeah, I mean, so. Fans of boxing, you know, have, have a, a something they like to say. You've probably heard this, you know, on any given day, you know, a lucky punch yep. is all it takes. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. You've got a pretty big project coming up. Uh, and I'm just looking at the calendar here and i think your episode is going to be out just a bit ahead of when it launches tell us about the tv series you got coming yeah oh so it's called legendary masters council um it's kind of it was inspired by uh, for those of you that are really into martial arts was inspired by the wmac masters an old show that i just loved that was in the from 95 to 96 97 and it had two seasons and it was this show that put the kind of the really well-known martial artists from movies or even in the like the iska or nasca circuit of martial arts that had um and they were in this like show and it was like it was kind of like reality yet not reality it was kind of hard yeah and so um it was a really great show they taught kids about 
or not just kids, but everyone about martial arts ethics, which I really believe in. And so um, I started doing a Q&A where I would go live every night and people could talk to me, ask me questions about my life, ask me about martial arts, everything. And one of my uh, kind of fans, he was like, hey, so I heard that um, they're, re they're doing a reboot, they're doing a remake of WMC Masters. And would you ever try to be on the show? It'd be so cool to have Jay Jack have a, the drunken master of TikTok uh, on, on. And I was like, whoa, that sounds cool. Drunken master of TikTok. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. But um, um, I was, I mean, if they asked me to, of course. I mean, like, I, I'm actually friends with a lot of the guys that were on the show. Mm -hmm. And so I spoke to uh, Ho Sun Pak, who played Superstar who was a really big martial artist. He was also one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And he was like, yeah, they've been talking about it, but it, no one's wanted to actually do it. And so I'm like, well, man, that's kind of crummy. But uh, I started talking to some of my friends and was thinking, man, I have the connections. Like I was just coming off this, uh, this independent uh, film for Mortal Kombat. Mm. Uh, filmed in the UK and I was like man I have friends that are in the industry producers directors cinematographers man I bet we could put something together like this and and do it yeah it'd be really cool um so I started talking to some of my friends about it um one of my good friends who was the writer of the show for the the Mortal Kombat film short film that we were, I was in, he also wrote the book that Pity Dreadful was mm -hmm. the story. Pity Dreadful was this Netflix mm -hmm. TV series, kind of like gothic, but he wrote the book that it was based off of. Oh, cool! And so he told me that he would write the script, and that, but I was telling him about the show, showed him some episodes, and he's like, you know, that's really cool and all, but it was cool for the '90s. He's like, you should, I mean, if you really want to relate to people and you should do something for one that's your own and, but something more modern. So we, we talked about how we were going to do it and he wrote out this really cool uh, script. And so we, we talked about it. We were going to make it a series, but what we needed was money. Like I'm not rich. <laughs> he wasn't rich. And so I'm like, well, what if we, this is what we can do. We can start a Kickstarter for it, for people to see if they really want it to happen. Um, <clears throat> I think that aside from me, let's take other martial artists, like let's do something like, let's get other TikTok creators mm -hmm. that are martial artists, that are real martial artists and not just like, yeah, they're, they're really interested in wanting to do this. And so we can do this, make it come together and let's do it. So I spoke to a few different, uh, martial artists that I'd seen on TikTok and we put it together nice. and I did a starter for we raised sixty five thousand dollars to uh to make the show and uh and so that's that's what's happened we've had some had a rough patch on getting it done but it did finally oh. uh, and it's coming out on it's being released on May 4th okay. but they're also uh, doing a premiere at a local theater on April 29th. So. Okay. And where can people find it? Uh, they'll be able to find it on Vimeo. Okay. Yeah. The pilot show, uh, we're going to have it on Vimeo. Uh, we want to use it to kind of like maybe send it to maybe get Netflix or Amazon. It, it, it's a pilot. Like, but Makes the sense. pilot, have to, but if we can do well and show everyone and people like it, uh, then we can. It's, makes it easier to go to these companies. I mean, kind of like using the idea of Cobra Kai. It started off on YouTube mm -hmm. and, and then Netflix liked it. And right. put, awesome. So that's awesome. And <clears throat> if people want to stay in touch, like so they can see developments with the show, you on social media, I know you're all over the place. So like give the audience all the, all the ads. <laughs> So you can find me on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Those are the three main ones that I use under Jade Jack Heather. Um, Where does that name come from, by the way? 
Uh, uh, you, you're, we have We don't have very many guests that have aliases or pseudonyms or whatever you would call it. Uh, but yours, I mean, honestly, because when it, when I looked in the notes, it was like I was like, who the hell's Dimitri Gary? So I was like, oh, hey, Jack, I know who that guy is. So where does that name come from? Oh, uh, okay. So, um, <laughs> Jay Jackhammer comes from, so in, in China, my, uh, my martial arts, uh, brothers and my teacher, um, one of my other teachers, so not sure that I'm a disciple, but I also trained in a kind of a village style in the temple and under, uh, Sui Zhong Wu, which is mm-hmm. As a lineage of Shaolin for over 700 years. Mm. And so it's where one of my main styles of Tongbei that I do. But it, it's really funny. Um, probably, I think that everyone kind of thinks it's weird that I'm a big guy and that I can jump around and stuff like that. So um, my coach at the time, I he we were doing a form and he made me do a tornado kick. And so I do it and he was like, oh my God, do that again. And I'm like, okay. And he takes out his phone and he starts filming it, me doing the tornado kick. And he's like, oh my God, so good, so good. Like, And he's like, oh, like, Hei Shun Feng. Hei Shun Feng uh, is the name of, I don't know if you've ever heard of the story, um, Warriors of Outlaws of the Marsh, mm. but there, it's a Chinese story that um, has there was this famous hero or outlaw that uh, depending on who's telling the story right uh, named Li Kui and he was supposed to be a really big guy he was dark and um, they but he was really strong his nickname was Haitian Feng which means Black Whirlwind and so they started calling me Black Whirlwind and obviously the black part being that I'm a black man. And so I was I was telling my godfather this and he's like, man, that's really cool and all, but because originally I had gone as like Haitian Feng, because I'm like, that's pretty cool, right? Um, my Chinese name, Wei Jie, means great hero. And so, which is a name that was given, it was given to me. I didn't yeah, make it up. And so he was like, oh, that's pretty cool, but Hey Shun Feng, you being in America, being a black man, you, you probably, I mean, like, <laughs> I don't, I mean, because people won't get it. Like, if you're in China, yeah, everyone completely understands and they would think it's a racial thing, right? Yeah, sure. yeah, and, yeah. But, but he's like, you know what? You get hit like a jackhammer, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and he's like, yeah. Why don't you be like a jackhammer? And I'm like, that's kind of like porn star <laughs> I, I, I was thinking i wasn't gonna say it but now that you've said it yeah that's where my brain went too yeah and so i'm like okay how about this so there is um uh, my school is called yu jai yu jai shaolin which means jade uh jade fortress mm. uh, jade fortress or yu jai is historically what uh the shaolin temple was called or the mm. area because of um in history books dating back hundreds of years or so and or thousands maybe and they like the temple in the, on the mountain um so it kind of looks like a fortress mm-hmm. and if you go right in the morning time right when like the sun is coming out and things like that it kind of have, has like a, a jade tint a greenish mm-hmm. tint and so they they refer to um shaolin as yujai <laughs> And so um, then I was like, oh, you know, maybe I'll be Jade Jackhammer. That'd be pretty cool, right? Because it'd have the the idea of Shaolin's. Because a lot of people think that the Shaolin Temple, for one, was just like it's just a building, mm-hmm. like a church, and that Shaolin was only in there. But in actuality, like the whole mountain area mm-hmm. had martial artists and different family styles that were connected to the temple, things like that. So I, in 2012, I went from just doing kind of like Shaolin lineage in the temple and went outside of the temple to learn uh, more kind of like older 
type of styles because it is kind of true though uh Shaolin is really old because of like the abbot um they've and different remember whoever the te your teacher's teacher is your lineage defines like how old your style is and if it's been mod modernized mm -hmm. now um about 10 years ago maybe i don't know i think i'm getting to the age that i'm kind of old so what seemed to be like five or ten years to me was actually like 20 plus years tell me about it yeah yeah I'm with so you. I've been back in the States for seven years. So I guess, yeah, it was probably like 15, 20 years ago, the abbot started to make a requirement that if people were teaching Shaolin, like like in Taekwondo and Karate styles, is that if you were teaching it, it had to be done this certain way. Not like, oh, well, I know this Xiao Hong Chen. I learned from this guy and he does it this way. Or I learned it from this guy and he does it this way. So they kind of, I don't know how they decided on what was going to be the core way that you do the movements, but that ended up happening. Mm -hmm. So we started trying to restructure and requiring people to go to the temple to learn the forms the way that they now want them to, to learn, mm -hmm. be taught. And I mean, I understand if you go from the idea of it being, him being like the CEO or um, like a business outside of being a temple and teaching culture that yeah, if you take what do karate, it's really big. And but they all generally do their forms the same way. Like there'll be little nuances, but they're kind of done the same way. And so he I guess that's what he was trying to do. So makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh we took a little detour, so let's come back. You were talking about your social media handles. I think you got through those. Are there any websites that people oh. should be aware of? Um, so people, my website is Jade Fortress and uh, yeah. And dot com? Uh, yes, jadefortress.com. It talks about my school. It talks about um, the TV show. I actually am in the process of starting this. I used to teach about a couple of years ago, uh, something that I called Shaolin Culture Educational. I had mentioned earlier that my Shifu had kind of put me in charge of all of the mm -hmm. disciples in the United States or outside of China mm -hmm. that because they didn't learn the language so it's mm -hmm. really in depth and so I started the Shaolin Culture Educational where it was completely free I did a Facebook um, live for a group that people could come and ask questions or I did a class for about an hour mm -hmm. where I taught not only the names and the techniques but the five principles of mastering your style and Shaolin, which are actually, you know what? I have a question for you. Let's, okay. Yeah, let's see what you think. So, what do you think the first thing is to master your style? I ask everyone this question. Let's see what you think. The hmm. first component to mastering your style. And don't think too hard about it, but yes. Practicing. Practicing. Almost. That's, I mean, like practice, you need to practice, but but something more important than practicing. You need this before you can practice. Be open to learning? That's also something that's important, but you're not, you're, I think you're thinking of it too grand. I probably am. Help so, me out. One, okay, so you have to learn, have something to practice. Okay, sure. <laughs> yes, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, you have to learn movements. So in Shaolin, the idea is that you first, learn the movements, and then you add speed and power to them, accuracy. Mm -hmm. And then you become ambidextrous. Right? Now we do speed and power before ambidex becoming ambidextrous is because the way, like it's a lot easier to learn something one way and then to be proficient at it and then switch over to be able to do the other side. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot harder to try to do both sides at the same time now you now you would naturally practice things on say your left and your right but a lot of times we really focus on one side and so um after you have learned you've really learned the techniques you become ambidextrous then after that um, this is something that a lot of people don't really do but it's done in shaolin so a lot of outside martial arts is that um the force, fourth is to practice on uneven terrain, different mm. So that's why in Shaolin we practice on, say, like 
the plum blossom poles we would pra we practice on a mountain right so your footing is really important it's not like some matted floor or some paved ground right. i mean if you're fighting someone especially if you're on a mountain you could literally slip on the dirt and gravel and fall like 100 feet right yeah. so your footing is really important also training in different climates like it's not just some air conditioned room with mats right so mm -hmm. training in the rain training in the snow because in reality we never know when we're going to be attacked and even if it's not about just fighting um so many people uh as they get older and like they slip on the ice crack their skull older people um having falling in the bathtub from having a wet uh floor right so all of these things if we train to know how to move our bodies in these different circumstances then we're a lot better off and uh, a lot it'll be a lot harder to get hurt right sure. and then the okay. fifth is to be applicable mm. so not only does the teacher uh, one of my favorite things and i do want to address this because uh, for the people i don't ever talk to people about this but I make on my TikTok videos or in my social media posts, uh, people, it's funny because I'll ask questions like, would you think this work in a fight? Or uh, this is how we would do this technique. And one of the common things that people like to say is, oh, um, well, it's easy if you have a compliant uh, uh, person. And for those, it's a special thing to let everyone know in this live. Um, so anytime you see me do a video, if you see it, like if it looks kind of sloppy or something like, you will never see some, uh, unless it's for a video reel of doing a movie, will it be like clean and cut and done? And the reason for that is the way my Shifu taught in Shaolin is that he was also, he had won some Sanda tournaments and uh, was a champion, right? So he, anytime he was teaching us a technique and he was like, oh, well, I'm gonna show you the application for it. And so he'd always like to pair me up because he's a small guy. I'm a big guy. It looks cooler to the students. Right. So he'd be like, okay, we're going to do this movement. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you want me to attack you? It's like, I want you to attack me. I'm like, well, do what? Do I do a backhand straight punch or a kick? Or he was like, I want you to attack me. And I would just think it up, cool, go out and throw something crazy. And he would still get the technique on me. Hmm. And the reason for that is that he's already confident in what he's doing and so he doesn't need me to tell him what i'm going to do so that he can get the he can be ready for the technique to come so he just want and i think that was his way of showing that he, if you know how to fight if you actually have martial skill you don't need to be told how the tech how to apply the technique mm. you know the technique and then you can use it on them that makes sense so, I've trained, that's how I, all my videos are done. So I do the video where the student, I don't tell them who it is, uh, what they're gonna do. I just tell them to attack me and then I'll do the technique on them. Whether I get them on that time or we move around and then I eventually get it on them. So awesome. yes, sort of a little secret that people didn't know. But yes, all Jean Jack have the Shaolin Culture Educational, I'll be mm -hmm. teaching that. Um, we, I'm trying to reboot it so it'll be mm -hmm. on the Jane Fortress uh, website, but people can sign up for it and get the Chinese language, uh, see application videos, uh, forms, and history. Great. Plenty of good stuff for people to check out. I hope they do. And this is where we're gonna we're gonna wind down. The next time they're gonna hear my voice will be in the outro. So this is your chance to close it out. What words do you want to leave the audience with today? Hmm. Uh, I think that I'll go in with how I always kind of end and just say happy training. Uh, so I think that happy training to me, it started as just kind of a joke, but I think it really encompasses my idea of when you train. Um, I feel that it's a lot easier to learn when you're not stressed. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have pressure or things like that, but when your mind is stressed, it's harder to um, receive things. If someone's yelling at you or 
if, yeah, if there's so much hardship outside of the point that you can't receive it, then it's useless. So always keeping, when I think of saying happy training, I'm thinking of you're happy doing something that you want to do. You can receive that. You can receive it a lot better. You can excel a lot better. So that's my idea. You can catch more flies with honey than vinegar, right? So if you're calm and you're happy, you can learn a lot more and do a lot more. So yeah, happy training. What a character. And I don't mean that in the way that he has an alias and that is his character. I mean, what a personality. And what I loved about my conversation with him was that he just, here I am. I'm me. I don't always get that when I talk to guests. If you've been listening or watching for a while, you know that some guests are more open than others. This is an example of someone who was incredibly open and it gave us no shortage of things to talk about. I look forward to the day we get to train together. I know it's going to happen because we actually have some mutual connections. Uh, somebody who's been on the show multiple times, someone who doesn't live too far away, they are actually first degree connections. And it was because of that wonderful person that Dimitri came on the show. So thank you, Sifu. Thank you. I appreciate your time, your openness, and all of it. Audience, I appreciate you just as much because what's a podcast without an audience? Thank you for being here. If you want to support us as Whistlekick, if you want to support this show, if you want to support me, if you want to support the team, share this episode with somebody. If you've already done that, leave it up a uh, review somewhere. Buy something using the code podcast15. Sign up for the newsletter. There are so many things that you can do. Okay. Now, here are two others that I didn't mention in the outro. We do seminars. You want to host me for a seminar? I'd love to come out and work with you and your students on some of the things that I find really interesting in the martial arts. Most people who bring me in for a seminar bring me back. So I guess that means I'm doing something right. You know what else we do right? Consulting. I believe in our methodology. It is far more holistic, far more authentic because all martial arts schools are different. Having a one size fits all approach to marketing and growth doesn't seem to resonate for a lot of people. And that's most of our clients. They've worked with other schools, uh, I'm sorry, other consultants or not, and said, you know what? Let's give this a try. Guess what? Schools rarely leave our consulting. Just as you rarely stop watching or listening, people stop contributing to the Patreon. That doesn't happen often. Why? Because it's about overwhelming value. And I make sure that all of our clients get overwhelming value out of our relationship. I appreciate our relationship, even if it's, as, if it's as simple as me talking and you listening. It means a lot to me. If you want to support us, do any of the things that I just mentioned. And if you want to talk to me about something, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick everywhere. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>